So I've been working for a long time on uh, water politics, on the politics of scarcity, politics of water management. And um, I know yesterday, I wasn't there unfortunately because of family reasons, but I know you spoke a lot about questions of scarcity, availability, integration, etc. but maybe from a slightly different lens. So I'm going to talk, start by talking a little about uh, scarcity. We all know there's a water issue, but you know, what, what is it that I am interested in about it? Um, I also want to argue that inequality in access to water is, a, is one of the biggest crimes of the 21st century. And I'll, I want to focus then on the transition from the MDGs to the SDGs. Um, the SDGs, there's lots to be celebrated, but there's quite a lot missing. So I think we really have a lot of work to do. Finally, I talk a little about the politics of integration, because integration is the buzzword. It's been a buzzword for a long time. It's been around for a long time. It has a long history and trajectory. But we look at current twists, and I'll focus a little on uh, research that we've just finalized in Southern Africa on integrated water resource management, and then I'll conclude. So of course, if you look at um, what you see up there, one would get the impression that we really um, have a, a serious water crisis. You've heard yesterday, and we all know the statistics, about less than 1% of water is fresh, and that blue little bubble represents that fresh water. So when you look at that, um, you know, it really comes to the fore that we, there is a crisis, and indeed there's a lot of talks about water wars linked with population growth, economic growth, environmental conflicts, and usually there are these solutions that are put forward. So either innovation, science and technology, the need to integrate, the need for the nexus, the need for et cetera, et cetera. Um, and different water management strategies. And when you look at something like this, this is IFPRI, I couldn't get the, the source to work. When you look at um, statistics here around the actual availability across regions, um, etc. I think I would like to say that even though all these statistics are valid, uh, my starting point is that there's enough water and food to go around. Uh, so I follow the Human Development Report of 2006 in rejecting neo-Malthusian notions of scarcity uh, and food security. And largely, annual renewable water resources are adequate to meet human needs. Still, of course, as indicated here, there's huge amounts of variation. Rainwater, surface, and groundwater resources are very unevenly distributed across the globe within regions and within countries. And there's lots of variability, often focused in poorer regions, leading to droughts and floods. And of course, climate change compounds all these issues and uncertainties and exacerbates and intersects with other drivers of change. So water availability, as you see up there, does not really translate to access to water. And access to water, especially for poor and marginalized groups, is usually determined by socio-economic, political, gender, and power relations. And much of my work actually has been on questions of scarcity and access. And we know all the, the figures, I don't need to repeat them, about six, 663 million people around the globe lack access to safe drinking water, and 2.4 billion lack access to improved sanitation, with almost one, um, 1 billion or sort of 900 million defecating in the open. So this really undermines good nutrition and health and is a global outrage. Accessing water is particularly challenging for smallholders, for vulnerable and marginalized populations, and women. And as I said, climate change is going to exacerbate a lot of these issues. So this is a scene in Tigray in, in Ethiopia, and I'll never forget this because we were driving along doing work on something quite different, and we stopped by to talk, uh, and there were about 20 women, and they had been waiting for six hours uh, to get water. And basically, they'd just been waiting for some, a little trickle to come out, and they were waiting for the supervisor, they were stuck there, there were children there who couldn't go to school. Um, and in some ways, I'll, I've been working on water for a long time, but I, I somehow will never ever forget this site. Um, because it does seem like an outrage that this should happen in the 21st century. None of these women were protesting, or none of them were complaining. They were just waiting there patiently. And to some extent, I think that reinforces and naturalizes the situation. Um, so I thought that in some ways, this is a kind of structural violence. Uh, Paul Farmer and other anthropologists see structural violence as social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. These arrangements are structural because they are embedded in political and economic aspects of daily life. They are violent because they cause harm 
though not to those directly or indirectly responsible for per perpetuating them. And in some ways, water is essential for life and human development, and the structural violence that affects millions lacking access to water causes multiple harms to people's lives. So be it around health, be it around livelihoods, be it around food security, etc. And it is largely the poor who are victims of structural violence, and their lives are largely at the behest of bureaucrats, of politicians, and their pernicious policies and programs. Um, so many of them affect people's lives in multiple ways. Um, and the suffering, this kind of suffering is usually silenced, it's rarely articulated, and people often lack voice, and they usually rarely struggle for their rights, or they not, may not even be aware of their rights. And usually it is historically and economically driven processes that tend to constrain individual agency. So some examples of structural violence for me would be uh, the caste system in India, where you, know, you still have lower castes and untouchables, so-called untouchables, excluded from accessing water. Structural violence is here, I would say, where women have been silenced, where they naturalize their situation, and they're made to wait six hours for water. If they don't get the water here, they'll walk for another hour and get water from a contaminated river stream. And for me, structural violence is also by virtue of race, for example. Um, Structural violence allowed apartheid South, Af Af South Africa to deny 12 million largely black South Africans access to water. By contrast, the white minority enjoyed and were, reaped the fruits of the sort of hydraulic um, civilization of all the works that were created. So in some ways, as I said, inequality in access to water I see it as a global outrage. There's, of course, no dearth of ideas, of meetings, of programs, of policies. But all these water management policies and programs have largely failed to address questions of long-term sustainability. And by sustainability, I refer to social and environmental sustainability, um, and maybe even economic, and definitely economic, and the interests of poor and marginalized people. And structural violence and invisible power have naturalized these water inequalities. And these seriously undermine human well-being, health, education, and the life chances of poor women and men. And largely, the debates have been shaped by key global players, so be it the bank, the World Water Council, the GWP, etc. Many of them mean well, you know, they are attendant to what's going on, but somehow these universalized and technocentric discourses, aggregate numbers and portrayals, uh, really have led to a primacy of, of definitions, of statistics, of issues, um, that do not really take into account poor people's needs, so they're top-down and disconnected. And instead, what we should be talking about is contentious politics and battles around what is actually really going to work for people and struggles over access and meaning. So we, we came to the end of the MDG era in 2015, and in, in 2012, the world had met the water MDG um, well in advance of the, of the deadline, but it was flawed on many counts. It failed to address universality. It left 800 million people using poor sources of water largely rural dwellers, poor people, um, peri-urban dwellers, as Sarah spoke about, they were largely completely bypassed. Um, regional variations, questions of gender equality were not looked at, so it was largely a focus on the low-hanging fruit. So in that sense, there's a lot to celebrate with the SDGs. The SDG on water and sanitation is a huge improvement, and of course the SDGs are very integrated. You have to, you know, all of them are interconnected. They're universal. Uh, they focus on the water SDG, focuses on equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all, and also focuses upfront on sanitation and hygiene. Water quality issues that were missing are addressed. Water scarcity concerns are there. IWRM is even one of the indicators, something I turn to later, etc. But despite all this stuff that I think is worth celebrating, there are some problems. Um, there's a huge number of indicators, and so there's going to be a lot of problems around monitoring and tracking. So we might be seeing a sort of new SDG industry, so to speak. There's a clear lack of mechanisms of accountability. You know, how do we take whom to account? Uh, how do we interpret questions? I mean, that was a problem with the MDG2. Questions of the service ladder, questions of what counts as improved, what counts as um, something that works, is all up for grabs. Um, and so while it does improve on the MDG, it, it still is open to interpretation. I would say that there's a lack of commitment to human rights in the SDGs. They're not explicitly stated there. 
And also there's a lack of attention to power imbalances. And these are the issues that create water crises or water management crises in the first place. So for example, the women's major group said, quote, concentration of power and wealth imbalances, the deep in poverty and inequalities within and between countries are not sufficiently addressed. And so the agenda lacks targets to reverse this trend. And so for the SDGs to be transformative, they need to acknowledge that the current development model based on growth has failed to address concentration of wealth that are deepening poverty, inequality, and environmental degradation. So now let me turn a little to water management now and the quest for integration. I know you spoke a lot about integration yesterday. Uh, integration has a long history in water management. It goes back to the early days in the United States, in Spain, in, in, in European water management. But um, in the 90s, after Dublin, it really came up as the major panacea, uh, the idea that we really need to integrate water supply and management, water and food, and now, of course, we have the nexus, which takes it to the next level. So, uh, since I'm going to focus a little on the findings from a project that I've just wrapped up, and it's in water alternatives, the current issue of water alternatives. It's called Flows and Practices. We focused on four countries, South Africa, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and Uganda. Sorry, five countries. Um, and we were interested in how ideas of IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management, that sort of has been, emerged as a panacea to address the water management crisis. It was a flagship project of the... Global Water Partnership and others, how it basically, ideas that were generated from the European and global level, how they translated to African uh, context. Because they've really rapidly spread. IWM is incorporated in over 80, in almost 90% of countries' water policies and has led to water reform, new water laws, etc. So within the African context, the challenge was interesting because experiences were mixed due to the complexity of river basins. They're far more complex than temperate zone river basins, overlapping and competing systems, especially around tenure, regime, etc. I'll just focus on one country. You can hopefully look at the special issue and look at some of the others. As I spoke about South Africa already, you know, apartheid left a very, very skewed legacy in terms of land and water access. Um, though 1994 was an incredible moment of independence where everything was rewritten and you came up with, they came up with amazing progressive policies that really sought to redress past inequalities. So the National Water Act implicitly embraced IWRM um, and it, it, it inspired a lot of things. It was a homegrown affair unlike some of the other countries we focused on where the influence of donors was far greater than in South Africa. But still, you know, experts were consulted and the new government emphasized integration as a policy paradigm. So the idea was to have catchment management agencies and out of 19 that were planned, only two are actually functioning today. And there's largely been a paralysis due to costly bureaucratic processes, problems with decentralization. There's a clear lack of integration across the departments, across the different levels, be it district, provincial, national, overlapping jurisdictions. Uh, this issue of national government outsourcing to locals and problems with provincial level, regional offices, etc. Despite really progressive legislation and also South Africa being one, the first country to actually embrace wholeheartedly the human right to water um, in its constitution and also come up with policies to endorse that, there's been a stickiness of inequality and not enough of radical reallocation of resources. There's still a domination of white um, commercial farmers. And land and water reform failed to coordinate. And of course, there's been a huge problem in terms of capacity. And we saw that across the board in the countries. New institutions were created ostensibly to integrate, ostensibly to achieve water reform, ostensibly to manage water better. But there was clear lack of capacity, uh, problems with jurisdiction, top-down donor agendas, that often countries fail to be able to understand and respond to adequately, and really serious problems with participation. So despite a huge emphasis on stakeholder participation, water user groups, etc., many of these were formed, but um, they often, yeah, I'm, I'm all right, I'll be, I'll be done. So in terms of, so when we say integration, and even when we're talking about the nexus now, the, the need to integrate water, food, energy, climate, I think we have to realize that integration is a deeply political process because there's always going to be trade-offs. Um, and in the countries where we did our research, people sat on their turfs, people had their agendas, and there was always this issue um, 
around the problems and the, the, the fact that it actually wasn't happening. It was so, more or less on paper, but it really was always very abstract to implement on the ground. And with our IWM research, we found that actually Africa was a kind of laboratory for IWRM. It was a kind of donor-imposed baby. Of course, now it, it has assumed a life of its own, so people really believe in it. They think it's helped them to talk to each other, to think in different ways. But still, the focus on the software or on management um, has come at some cost. So one cost has been access has not really been enlarged. Um, infrastructure has not really been developed. It's not like resilience to climate and variability has been enhanced. And several alternatives were squashed. So there was a huge contradiction around these reforms, um, around water management. And in the name of participation and decentralization, in some ways, you've had more centralization of the state, uh, more assertion of power over users, and more power even vested to large users of water. Um, and a lot of these basin offices often, through IWM, facilitated uh, land and water grabs because large users are the ones that could benefit, that could buy the license, that knew how to work around the system, and often smaller users whose rights were enshrined in customary systems failed out. So the introduction of water pricing and permits allowed for powerful and wealthy water users to take advantage of water payments to secure water rights at the expense of unregistered small users who depend on primary water for their livelihoods. And we have a very interesting case there in, in Tanzania of, of clear water grabbing on the part of sugar companies, etc., um, and you know, who really had skewed allocation through some of these systems. There was a poor capacity to implement the reform and for new institutions to work and talk to each other, etc. And despite focus on equitable allocation, marginalized groups did not benefit. So if I can now just briefly wrap up with the nexus, you know, there's obviously we agree that it's very important to integrate water, energy, food, climate. Um, and in some ways, water is the heart of the nexus. Um, it was, it was a, a major issue. The origins of the nexus are really interesting because the World Economic Forum um, suddenly discovered that water was really important. Water scarcity was a major, major issue. So in some ways, we have to realize that it, it has corporate origins. Now, that needn't be a bad thing, but there is a politics of knowledge around the nexus because local people, you know, in fishers and farmers and customary farmers or others, I think they know that water, land, and food are integrated. They know that fishing and dams are interconnected. It's people up there that often have their silos and do not talk to each other. So in some ways, the politics of knowledge really has to be made explicit. You know, whose silos are we talking about? And whose security risks are we concerned about? Because very often, people who are really interested in the nexus, the corporates and the companies, are interested in securing their own water security. And often, that could increase water insecurities for poor users, for customary users, for women, etc. And that's particularly true in contexts where um, rights are not formal. So often this can be a distraction from land and water grab. Now something I haven't put up there is of course researchers, all of us in research are very interested in the nexus because in some ways it gives us an opportunity to talk to each other. It helps us to engage in interpersonal dialogue. It, modelers think that they can do more modeling, etc. But I think we need to be aware of you know, whether this is in some ways a repetition of what we've seen before. Um, and we need to be aware that in some ways this can be a solution, or is it a new buzzword? Is it going to make a difference? And ultimately, the governance of water and water management, land and food, they are shaped by historical and cultural legacies. So unless we address those, I don't think we're going to um, highlight some of, we're, not, we're going to address some of the critical issues uh, around ac access and equity. So to conclude, uh, I've tried to highlight questions of access and ma management. Um, and what I've tried to say is that we, we're talking about deep structural inequality um, and violence and power imbalances that perpetuate inequality in the water sector. Many of these intersect with historical, economic, and other circumstances. And even though integration is something we want to achieve, integration so far has failed to address questions of access and inequality. And it will continue to do so unless it really steps back and sees integration as something that is deeply political and not something that is just something that is technical. And unless these imbalances are addressed, the SDGs, as well as future water policies, will not deliver and they will fail. Thank you.
right, thanks, Lila. Do we have questions? And I'll... Ah, oh, we've got a couple of microphones, so... Uh, I'll kick us off. I'd like to just take up your sort of second to last point about researchers in the nexus, because that's something that has struck me. Um, the engineering research community has been jumping on the nexus bandwagon. Mm -hmm. And it's often, as you say, it's at that big system level of, you know, big water infrastructure, big global kind of systems often. Um, and is there a way that the research community can um, change that discourse or change that kind of way of looking at things? How, how should the research community be more supportive of this kind of grassroots, local experience, lived experience of a nexus, rather than the big kind of global, um, you know, dominant modelling, um, you know, very big picture, removed version of the nexus? Now or? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, well that, that's a good question. I'm actually um, a co-investigator of the uh, ESRC Nexus Network. And this is a question we've been grappling with a lot. I think also there is a dis difference in disciplinary takes on the Nexus. So while social scientists have tended to raise some of the questions that I've raised here, um, I think so I think in the first instance is to have a dialogue between, let's say, what we're doing today, like social science and the engineers or the modelers, et cetera, you know, to talk about what actually this means at different levels and at different scales. Um, and also just the generation of new data, because we saw that with, with IWM2, you know, it unleashed a huge data generating exercise all across Asia, Africa, but just having more information or more models does not really enhance the issue or does not really you know, make the huge difference on the ground. It does to some extent, but then you also need to have the capacity to use these systems. And in, in the countries we found, in, in the five countries we were working in, that capacity wasn't quite there. Maybe it, it is coming up, but it, it, so I think there's a question of all that. So I think having the dialogue, um, being honest about why we're doing it, I mean, you know, often, let's face it, we all are in a environment of deep funding constraints, so we tend to follow the buzzwords too in terms of our research. Um, but, you know, maybe have an honest dialogue with each other of where things are going and how we can really make a difference. Now, I'm not dismissive of it totally. I think there's a, there's a huge strength in it, but I think we just need to be aware of some of the problems and potential pitfalls. Uh, okay, we'll take one question here and then... Uh, my name is uh, Nicholas Falk, uh, I'm particularly interested in India. Um, are there examples where water companies act as effectively development agencies deciding uh, where growth should occur? Because it seems to me that uh, as water is so critical, uh, they could play a key role in planning and development, deciding, uh, helping to ensure that places which are are best suited for farming remain in use growing food and also then determining where urbanization takes place? Um, I would say it's often the opposite. I was in to India a week and a half ago. I was in an area where I did my PhD, which is Western India Kutch, uh, which moved from being a real backwater to the central industrial zone now of Asia. And um, I'm not sure companies really chose to go there to improve things for local people. I mean, you know, it was, so you have SEZs coming up there. And a lot, what has often happened is that then, once the company moves in, and there's been loads of companies moving into this area, the Tatas, the Adanis, the huge... So I meant state water companies. I, I meant utilities. Sorry, utilities. I, I, I okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Shall I just finish what I said? Yeah. Or, um, so anyway, I'll talk about corporate business company, businesses, and then I'll talk about utilities. So I think what happened there was, yes, they did end up playing development roles because they had to, because often the state had moved out and they created a, a sort of relations of patronage. Uh, there was resources were being extracted and so there were all sorts of issues there. So what, your, your question was now on utilities? It, yes, it was specifically, it, it seems to me that the utility, if it's a nationalized industry mm -hmm. as it is say, in Tamil Nadu, could yeah. play a, a key role in deciding uh, where growth occurs and where it shouldn't occur. In other words, it, it could play a positive role in land use planning 
and I wondered if there were examples of uh, such a role, um, uh, because uh, yeah. the same could apply in, in this country as well, the, sure. uh, the, where water or infrastructure is so such a huge cost of new development, it might be sensible to start with infrastructure planning rather than the other way around. Yeah, yeah no, I absolutely agree with you. I don't have any examples, but I think you have, you have a good one there in Tamil Nadu, maybe. Um, mm. But that's, yeah, that sounds, that, that, I, don't, I don't have more to add on it. Yeah, yeah and that would be a nice thing to happen in this country, but it certainly doesn't. So, um, yeah, we've got a question there and then down the front here. I think we might just take, we'll kind of take a bit of a wrap up of questions. So does anyone else have any burning questions? Okay, so we'll take these two questions together and then yeah. you can respond. Okay, so we'll just hold on to that population and gender issues. <coughs> Tony Allen, King's College. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, uh, <coughs> the nexus. I try to avoid the nexus, although I've published three times on it unwillingly. Um, the reason is that uh, I agree with you totally, and we always do, that you should start with the politics and what's actually there, rather than imagining some optimum up here, which is impossible, mm -hmm. because just as you know, the QWERTY keyboard is there, you don't change it. The path dependence of where we are is so strong that we should recognize there's a food supply chain, which is mainly in the private sector, <coughs> There's an energy supply chain, which is often in the public sector, but also in the private sector. And <clears throat> there's the uh, water supply chain, or the water services and, um, <coughs> and sewage. Those three, uh, in their private and public failed markets and non-failed markets, are where you must start. Uh, would you agree with that? And is that this taking some part in your agenda of your research group because if you don't start with where the politics and the political economy is you will waste your time yeah i completely agree with you and yeah we've had this di discussion before too so thank you very much for that um so of course gender equality is very important and i think uh, we all I, I really believe in gender i mean you know it's it, mdgs didn't adequately address it i hope the sdgs address it sufficiently. Uh, gender equality is, is important for women's empowerment for, I mean, and there's, you can take a utilitarian reason to, to justify it. You can take a, um, a reason for the, just for the sake of gender and, and equality and women's empowerment. Um, I don't quite agree with the population thing because I was, uh, I, I was part of, um, I, I was the lead author of a water for food security report for the CFS and the HLP and I think we looked at quite a lot of the figures and um, for me it's more a question of access and distribution and politics it's not actual volumetric issues around water and food so those women waiting there 4.3 billion in Africa by 2400 yeah but that, 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 that will be addressed. There will be. There will be. That it will be. I, I believe it will be. Means that Africa is going to be a food importing continent for the rest of the century. Well, there's 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 food and food. So there's food that people grow, and often their their rights are being trampled on. So a lot of people have different views on you know what food we're talking about. More people than in Asia. Okay. Um, 
All right, so I think we'll wrap that conversation up there. So thanks very much to Lila for, um, for a great talk and for a provocative discussion. Thank you.